Welcome to Who's Number One. I'm Trey Wingo. They were surefire, guaranteed, can't possibly miss, bet the house all-time locks. We're talking about football players, folks, specifically those chosen in the NFL draft to trumpeting fanfare and millions, millions of dollars. And then from off the high board into the pool of great expectations, they belly flopped. We're talking draft bus, folks, flopperuskies. We're talking about players who are supposed to be go to the cashier and collect sure things and turned out instead to be sonic booming busts. You know who they are. ESPN Classic presents the 20 biggest NFL draft busts. And trust me, this is the one category in which nobody wants to be number one. 20, 20, 20. Cardinals are a good example of a team that drafts players and then fails to develop them. Michigan State linebacker Anthony Bell, Tennessee wideout Clyde Duncan, Colorado State quarterback Kelly Stouffer, Mississippi defensive end Freddie Jonun. From 1984 to 1987, the Cardinals went 0 for 4 in the draft's first round. I guess it all starts from the top, and there always seemed to be confusion surrounding the Cardinals, and their draft reflected it, and their wins and losses have reflected it. Everybody's going to point to Bill Bidwell. How can you have a good organization when he is your owner? Kelly Stauffer, they couldn't even get him signed, and, and he wound up playing his short career elsewhere. Players that they drafted were not graded out that highly. But overall, it was just a series of, of evaluations that the Cardinals made that didn't fall in line with what the rest of the league really thought. Luck plays a big role in any uh, draft bust. But in the case when you see a pattern like the Cardinals and they make mistakes year after year after year, you better start looking at the people that are making the decisions. Cincinnati has perhaps the worst draft history in the National Football League. 19. He's going for all of them. End zone. Touchdown! Oh, Incredible catch! From 1992 to 1995, the Bengals, on Mike Brown's watch, drafted no worse than sixth and were sure they had hit pay dirt. But for the bungling Bengals, pay dirt turned out to be a swamp. They did have a string of bad picks. They had a string of very high picks, none of which worked out for them. David Klingler was a sensational college football quarterback, but clearly he's unathletic and not very strong in the pocket, a little bit sidearm, bust. John Carter, I think, could have been a, a top player had he ever been healthy. If only he didn't get hurt and get hurt and get hurt. Copeland was the product of a national championship team and was just a very good college football player who didn't translate into pro football. Big Daddy Wilkinson was just not a hard-working player when he got to the Bengals. He had all the talent in the world. He got by on that talent for a while in pro football, but he was not worthy of the number one overall pick. These guys may have been good football players, but they just went to the wrong franchise because they didn't have the best teaching coaching staff. You could have brought anybody in there and there was a good chance they were gonna fail. Hell, they could have destroyed Troy Aikman. If they drafted Jerry Rice, Jerry Rice probably would have been out of the league with inside of two or three years. Eight, eight. Most of the teams in the league would have made the same mistake and taken Andre Bruce had they had the top pick in the draft. Eight. In 1988, blinded by his speed rush, Atlanta took Auburn linebacker Andre Bruce. Among those whom the grievously mistaken Falcons could have drafted instead, how about Michael Irvin, Tim Brown, or Bill Romanowski? Andre Bruce was as big a rush guy off the corner as anybody I had ever seen. It was a disservice to him to, to be drafted that high. He was not nearly as good as his draft position indicated. First selection, the first round, Atlanta selects Andre Bruce, linebacker Auburn. Playing that position defensively, you're required to do more than just use your speed to come off the corner to kill the quarterback. So when he got to the NFL and there were requirements beyond just doing that, he had a problem. Funny thing about Andre Bruce is that he lasted a pretty long time in the NFL, not as a great player, certainly, but one that was serviceable. Because you're number one, you know, right away you're supposed to be a difference maker, and he was not a franchise player. He just never really was capable of ever living up to expectations. 17, 17, 17. And a tip by Courtney Brown and intercepted. Touchdown, Courtney Brown. 
call me a nut, but I thought that there was a he was a can't miss. I don't know how that didn't work. 17. Courtney Brown was as unstoppable as an avalanche at Penn State, but as the first overall pick in 2000 by Cleveland, the often hurt defensive end melted away, averaging only 29 tackles a season over five years before the Browns released him. Courtney Brown, when he came out, the big debate was, do you take him or do you take his Penn State teammate, LeVar Arrington? Who's going to end up having the better career? Who's going to end up being the more dominant player? The uh, first choice in the NFL draft, the Cleveland Browns select Courtney Brown. Who? Courtney Brown? He was the number one pick in, in, in an NFL draft. I had no idea. Why hasn't he worked in, in the pros as well? He probably has been derailed by injuries more than anything else. For raw talent, he was one of the quickest defensive ends I saw. And unfortunately, with the injuries, we never had a chance to see the sustained quickness. He doesn't have that intensity, that drive, that will to dominate football games with the God-given talent that he clearly still has. LeVar Ankin, obviously, with the Redskins, has been a heck of a player. Courtney Brown, to this day, has not been able to stay fully healthy and has certainly not shown anywhere near the pass rush ability with the Cleveland Browns that he did in the college level at Penn State. When he came out of Wisconsin, he was going to be something supernatural, maybe a combination of, of speed and power that the game hadn't seen since Earl Campbell. 16. Here's a guy who absolutely dominated in the Big Ten, a good college conference. Oh, what a great day to run that was. Ron Dane clearly was a guy that was the beneficiary of an outstanding offensive line. With big holes playing against defenses that weren't across the board physically imposing as they are in the NFL. He was the great Dane at Wisconsin, the Heisman Trophy winner of 99, and the Giants' top pick in the 2000 draft. But as a running back in the NFL, Dane, more bark than bite, unable to average four yards per rush in any season. He came into the league kind of billed as the thunder to Tiki Barber's lightning, and, you know, thunder never rumbled. Ron is a little man in a big man's body. He doesn't think of himself as a power back. He got it in his mind at Wisconsin that he was twinkle toes, that he had a little bit of this and a little bit of that. He could make you miss. It would have been cool if he turned into another Jerome Bettis or, or somebody like that. But that wasn't what he did in college. He was more of a guy that hit the edge and then used speed. If Ron Dane could ever figure out that he's just your basic 250-pound sledgehammer, he could be a very useful pro back. Ron's style of running was great in college, but in the NFL, it didn't work. 15. 15. Johnny Lamb Jones, a, a guy that could dominate uh, college football uh, because of his speed. As a collegian, uh, you could fly to the ball, and you could disguise sometimes your frailties at that position. Johnny Lamb Jones was not physical enough to be a high-caliber NFL player. At Texas, Johnny Lamb Jones was a star. In the Olympics, he won gold. But as the number two overall pick in 1980 by the Jets, he reminded Draftniks that speed alone, not enough. He wasn't a football player who happened to run track. It was the other way around. That's why he was a bust. He was not a receiver. He was a guy who ran 100 meters. If you just wanted a guy to run nine routes up the sideline and say, beat that corner and we'll try to throw you the ball deep, Lamb Jones might have been your guy. People thought he was going to fly by everyone as a deep threat in pro football. And he had his moments, but he never quite lived up to his lofty draft perch. I just remember one of the Jets coaches telling me after they had drafted him, there's one thing that we didn't we didn't understand about Johnny Lamb Jones. He can't catch the football. Fourteen. Fourteen. Edis whips the first one and breaks free. 40, 45, still going. Touchdown. Physically, this was a guy that just you looked at him and you said, he has all the tools. That guy's gonna be a star. 14. 
With the uh, fifth pick in the draft, Chicago Bears select running back, Penn State University, Curtis Enos. Curtis Enos was a monster running back at Penn State, so he seemed a perfect fit for the Monsters of the Midway. The Bears drafted him fifth overall in 1998, but the monster was Meek. In three seasons, he rushed for four touchdowns. I don't know what happened to Curtis Enos. God, he was horrible in the National Football League. Curtis Enos was a guy who was great running in holes. You better be able to make some of your own yards when you play for the Bears, because late in the season, that's going to be what you have to do to win. He was more about the money and the contract and everything else and didn't necessarily have the desire to be the best he could be in the National Football League. And that's one thing the NFL does is, is exposes players that are either iffy about it or aren't sure what they want to do. And it showed itself early and he and the Bears were victims of that. 13, 13, 13. Terry Baker might be one of the first of the Heisman Trophy bombs that I can remember as a quarterback. 13. Terry Baker was a run first pass second quarterback at Oregon State. Good enough to win the Heisman in 62 and entice the Rams into drafting him number one overall. They made him running back and in three years he rushed for 210 yards. He might have been ahead of his time because he was a very mobile quarterback and of course that was way before the West Coast or any kind of offense that, uh, that used his skills. The draft really wasn't as sophisticated in terms of, of scouting. There wasn't a combine at the time. It was before the days of cable television, before uh, ESPN's game day. We didn't see players unless they were in your area or on the ABC Game of the Week. So Terry Baker was kind of a creation of the media people on the West Coast. And NFL teams didn't get enough hands-on scouting with this guy. If they could have played single wing, I guess, in the NFL, he would have been a great player. But, you know, they actually had to throw the ball down the field, and he just wasn't up to that. He wasn't nearly as polished as you need to be in the passing game to be a contributor in the NFL. 12. Blair Thomas was... <laughs> He was as big a go-to back as I ever saw in college. Blair Thomas will score! He's the one who epitomized the term Penn State running back when you talk about what a real bust is. Wow. Blair Thomas was cat quick and uncatchable at Penn State. The Jets drafted him number two overall in 1990. In six years, he scored a grand total of nine touchdowns, becoming the third Nittany Lion running back to make our list of enigmatics. Blair Thomas, we all thought was going to be a heck of a football player. You know, kind of shot away from contact, never really got going. I don't know if it was a matter that uh, he didn't like the sport, didn't like the pain of the sport. I mean, you saw that he had that kind of sleek body and speed, but it never did translate into the NFL. He was just along for a great ride at Penn State with a lot of offensive linemen who did become NFL players and or stars. Blair seemed to be the one that kind of set the bad trend for running backs coming out of Penn State. Everybody always felt there must be something in the water in Happy Valley because these guys come to the NFL and they just can't run hard. He wasn't a terrible player. Sometimes when you take these guys as high as Blair Thomas was selected, you raise expectations to a, a little bit of an unrealistic level. Even if you have a, a decent career, it's not good enough. High draft picks got to have a great career. And although Thomas had a few moments, certainly a few and far between. Steve Entman was so big and turned out to be so brittle. The University of Washington defensive tackle was the number one overall pick in 92 by Indianapolis. But in six injury-filled seasons with the Colts, Dolphins, and Redskins, he was able to start only 19 games. He was a product of the weightlifting craze. By whatever means, he got way bigger in college than his joints would carry. Entman, outstanding, a 280-pound tackle. Emma was a guy who could dominate at the college level because of his raw strength. Against college guys, Steve was a man among boys. But when he gets onto the pro level, at some point, all those guys are equally as big or stronger or faster. Quickly, he was exposed 
as just another guy. When he was in Indianapolis, he could never be healthy. And that happens a lot of times when you're a big muscle weightlifter guy and you're not very athletic. You just don't hold up well under all the physical beating. One of the great specimens as far as what you would want in seeing a player develop as a defensive tackle, but unfortunately, because of those injuries, he never developed in the NFL and had a very short career. I know it's painful, and you say you've covered your eyes and you can't bear to watch anymore. Well, take a look anyway. It does get worse. Here's number 10. Rick Meyer is a guy that was anointed the next great Notre Dame quarterback. There was something about being a quarterback at Notre Dame that just uh, had everyone enamored at any given time, no matter who he was. I mean, he was supposed to be Montana, he was supposed to be Theismann, he was supposed to be Hanratty, and he turned out to be nothing. Ten. The Seahawks chose Rick Meyer second overall in 93, expecting him to take them great distances. He's logged the miles all right by himself. Chicago, Green Bay, New York, San Francisco, Oakland, and Detroit. It looked like he was going to be okay. I think he's actually rookie of the year. But after that, it was straight downhill. Got a lot of longevity out of the fact that the great Bill Walsh dubbed him as sort of a next Montana type, but his play on the field never proved it. He couldn't throw the football accurately. I don't understand why people couldn't see that. If given any pass pressure, he completely fell apart. Tom Flores and the people who were running the Seahawks at that point realized he just wasn't all that. Here's a guy who two teams spent first round picks on because he was traded uh, by the Seahawks to the Bears for a first round pick. It's kind of disappointing to me uh, that he has not had, had a better career. He's had a long career, but not playing a whole lot. And it's like, whatever became of Rick Meyer? And he's still floating around, but you never know what team he's on. He was a victim of hype. So much pressure, so much money, so much time put into a guy, and then you flop. Washington waited 33 years to spend its top pick on a quarterback. In 94, the Redskins spent it on Heath Shuler of Tennessee. They should have waited longer. His career stats, 15 touchdown throws, 33 picks. What a move inside the 10-5 touchdown! Redskins have made some bad choices over the years, but this was one of the worst. Like if you talk to Redskins people, they, they always keep trying to say, well, it was, it was his pick. He had succeeded uh, very much so at, at uh, Tennessee because of his athletic skills. Tennessee at that time had such great receivers that they ran a lot of two-man routes. He didn't have to make a lot of reads. At the next level, he was having trouble adjusting to defenses and, and actually learning offenses. Within a few games, they, they realized he, he didn't have it. He couldn't do it. And all of a sudden, here's his low-round draft choice, Gus Farad, who comes in and simply from the very beginning looks better. Do you think of their quarterbacks over time as vibrant sort of leaders, guys who were enthusiastic and vocal in the huddle? And Heath Shuler was, was not those things. He was a nice guy. Nice guys can play quarterback, but they better have a tough shell around them. Heath Shuler never had that tough shell. Because of the great crescendo of interest, it made the flop, the thud, that much louder. There were so many expectations, and unfortunately, in the end, just so many disappointments for Heath Shuler. Eight, 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 eight. With the first pick in the draft, the Cincinnati Bengals have selected running back from Penn State, Kajana Carter. Bengals. Bengals. Go to Cincinnati, number one. See ya. Something bad's gonna happen. Could Kajana Carter avoid the Cincinnati curse and the Penn State curse? Short answer, uh, no. Since being drafted in 95, he's played in only 59 games, and with two surgeries and a boatload of injuries, seems to have more stitches than yards. Curtis Enos, Blair Thomas, Kajana Carter, that's the curse of the Penn State backs. No one wants to take a Penn State back anymore after these three guys all were huge busts. Kijana 
He was someone that just got hit by the injury bug and couldn't shake it. It was like one injury after another injury. You kind of feel for the guy because he worked so hard to get back and then re-injures himself. Kajana Carter, even before he hurt the knee, seemed to be having a tough time figuring out what an NFL hole was. I wish he hadn't hurt the knee because then we'd know for sure. And when you see what he's been through and how he adapted to the role of being a bit player to make a roster, to just suit out and be a, a player uh, with the New Orleans Saints, by example, says a lot about the guy. He just was a guy that I think was on the verge of really being a good player in the NFL. He's going to be looked upon. You look at the draft, say, oh, well, look at that guy. Look where he was taken, and he never made it. But in fairness to him, it wasn't his fault. Join me in the signal honor of awarding the 1989 Heisman Memorial Trophy to Andre Ware of the University of Houston. His senior year alone, quarterback Andre Ware passed for almost 4,700 yards and 46 touchdowns. Detroit was understandably smitten and took him seventh in 1990. But in the NFL, Andre was overmatched. His career, four seasons, 14 games, five touchdown throws. There are a lot of Heisman Trophy winners who did not do particularly well in the National Football League, but I can't remember one who was such an unmitigated bust. The Detroit Lions select okay. Andre okay. Ware, quarterback Houston. <laughs> They're committed to the run and shoot. This is the best guy that ever ran the run and shoot. And when he was picked by the Detroit Lions, you thought, boy, it was falling perfectly into place. But Andre Ware never was able to settle in. The system worked in college, but you get in the NFL where the big boys are and where these defensive coordinators have seen everything. It better be more than the system. You better have the talent, and you better have the mental toughness to back it up. And unfortunately, he came up short on both areas. He'll be remembered for his college greatness and his disappearing act in the NFL. Six, six, six. The Cleveland Browns selection is from the University of Kentucky, quarterback Tim Couch. Cleveland obviously made a mistake when they could have had Donovan McNabb. Six. The Browns could have had Dante Culpepper, too. But in 1999, they went with Tim Couch, and they've lived to regret it. Among his numbers in a short, forgettable career, 64 touchdown passes, 67 picks. He was, in large part, the product of a pass-first system at Kentucky. They didn't really ever attempt to establish the run. It was just chunk it, chunk it, chunk it. <laughs> When he got to the NFL and the game became a bit more sophisticated, he just did not have the wherewithal to deal with that. And he came to an expansion football team that was going to suffer for a while. And I think the fact that Tim got beat up certainly caused him to lose some of his confidence. Everybody just kept waiting for Tim Couch to turn into this great something into Tom Brady. And he never became Tom Brady. He didn't have much tenacity at all. If I could pour some Doug Flutie, let's say, in that body of couches, it might be OK. When a team like the Green Bay Packers bring you in, thinking that, hey, former first round draft pick, and they jettison you after a couple days in camp, we have to wonder where his career is going. Ultimately, just didn't have that swagger that every NFL quarterback needs to inspire the fans, to inspire your team, and most importantly, to inspire yourself. Five, five, five. Lawrence Phillips has been thrown off the team for allegedly assaulting a woman. Five. On the field, Nebraska's running back Lawrence Phillips was all but unstoppable. Off the field, he was, well, all but unstoppable. The Rams drafted him number six overall in 96. He played in a rage and lived that way, too. It's a Phillips has been ordered to serve 30 days in jail in Nebraska. This is a guy with trouble written all over him. And you bring him in, and you want your city to embrace him, when in fact they should be picketing. He obviously had no clue how to respect authority, how to stay within the law, how to treat women correctly. A battery complaint has been filed by a woman who claims that Phillips assaulted her. This guy should be getting attention and help. He should not be being drafted and being brought into the National Football League. Dick Vermeil passionately believed in Lawrence Phillips. 
tried to scare him straight, tried to love him straight, but in the end, there were too many demons inside Lawrence Phillips. Sooner or later, you're an adult and you have to look in the mirror and maybe say, part of the problem is me. Organizations kept employing him, almost saying to him, okay, Lawrence, it's okay, you know, you can be a thug. He got second chances, he got third chances. People were always trying to help him, and what a colossal waste of talent. The Boz is, is highly controversial. He's highly sensational. He's the extreme. Four. At Oklahoma, Brian Bosworth created a renegade image and then drafted in 87 by Seattle. He spent three years trying to live up to it. He had his 15 minutes of fame as the Boz exited stage left. He was a really good college football player with attitude at a time in the 80s where swagger really mattered. He wasn't Brian Bosworth, man. He was a Boz. Bosworth, number 44. Very few people have a nickname that ends in the Z. You're the Fonz. You're the Boz. Brian Bosworth, booming him down. And he s as a pro. Brian Bosworth, it's one of the greatest marketing jobs ever done by a professional athlete. Boz was Madonna in shoulder pads. I mean, Madonna had shoulder pads, but Boz's were bigger. It was driving a Corvette convertible. It was chasing chicks. It was the cool thing to do, and he was, he was it. He was the master at image. Brian Bosworth reminds me of Deion Sanders at Florida State when he basically invented the persona of prime time. And Brian Bosworth was exactly that, only he was about a third the football player. In the NFL, the publicity came first. The performance never equaled what happened in Oklahoma. I don't think his career was ever the same when Bo Jackson ran him over for a touchdown. Here's Bo, and here goes Bo for the touchdown. He and Bosworth one on one, and Jackson just jumps him into the end zone. Everybody's expectation that Boz was going to come in and storm the NFL and be the next Dick Butkus was so beyond any of my control. His career just fizzled out, but he had the whole country right there for a short period of time. Three, three, three. Tom Rivich didn't want to be a football player at all. I mean, Tom Rivich does now, wishes he had. Three. Todd Marinovich wasn't raised as much as he was programmed. His father tried to create RoboQB. Drafted out of Southern Cal in 91 in the first round by the Raiders, he never came close to what Al Davis wanted, playing just eight games in two seasons. Todd was engineered to a great extent by his father from the time he was born to be in the National Football League. His dad tied his right arm behind his back when he was an infant and a toddler, so he'd be left-handed. <laughs> the guy had never had a cheeseburger, had never gone to McDonald's. And every waking moment had to be spent building his body toward pro football stardom. Oh, full of power, full of power, strong, He's strong, red, red. This guy had basket case written all over him because of the way he was raised. I remember when we drafted him, he had amazing ability, but just didn't apply himself. He just took it for granted that he could still play quarterback without being dedicated, and, and it was a joke. He couldn't do that. He was under such pressure, and he obviously just wanted to be a kid. He was someone who fell into problems with alcohol and drugs, and really, I think, was lashing out at his father for robbing him of the childhood that he never had. Todd Marinovich just being a living, breathing member of society is a huge triumph. Oh, yeah, he didn't cut it in the NFL, and he liked to surf naked, and he liked to party, but it could have been a lot worse. There's a kid that had a great opportunity um, to do something and do it well, and they let it slip. You're not supposed to be as strong as I am. You're not supposed to be as fast as I am. You're not supposed to be as good as I am. Two. Seduced by his size, Green Bay took Michigan State tackle Tony Mandrich with the number two overall pick in 89, the highest an offensive lineman had ever been drafted. The Packers could have had a bunch of Sanders, like Dion or Barry, instead. Nobody had a better body as an offensive lineman. Everybody 
had him rated the highest lineman they've ever graded. It wasn't like one, two, three, four guys like, oh, those foolish Packers. Everybody, they all agreed. That was a Sports Illustrated production. That was a guy we invented and we tore down. And you wouldn't think general managers would buy into it, but they did. They bought into this kid as a great, great player. And he wasn't, it was all hype. Everybody in the NFL wanted them to be the greatest offensive lineman of all time and wanted them to be the superhuman pancake guy. If you've been described in your college career as an all-time great, how can you fail? Every NFL general manager should just have a picture of Tony Mannerich on the wall and look at it any time they have any doubt whatsoever about a guy they're about to draft, wondering whether his body is for real or the result of science and technology. If you are going to select an offensive lineman high in the draft, you better make sure he has quick feet so he could play the left tackle position. Otherwise, he's not worth taking that high. Tony Mandrich didn't have the feet to play the left tackle position. He was not a complete washout. He was a good player for a period of time in Indianapolis, but initially with Green Bay, he was a major disappointment. In Welcome back to Who's Number One and the 20 biggest NFL draft busts of all time. Let's recap. Cardinal busts. Bengals bungles. Andre Bruce. Courtney Brown. Ron Dane. Johnny Lamb Jones. Curtis Enos. Terry Baker. Blair Thomas. Steve Eppman. Rick Meyer. Kajana Carter. Seven, seven, seven. Andre Ware. Six, six, six. Tim Couch. Five, five, five. Lawrence Phillips. Four, four, four. Brian Bosworth. Todd Marinovich. Two, two, two. Tony Mandarich. So who is number one? Well, let's just say our choice for this dubious honor earned it. And he did it in spectacular fashion. One, 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 one. There were those that thought he was better than Peyton Manning. We all look at this and say it was a slam dunk. Manning over Leaf when on draft day, that was obviously not the case. What? With the uh, second choice in the draft, the San Diego Chargers select quarterback, Brian Leaf. In 1998, the Chargers' Bobby Beathard emptied the vault for Washington State quarterback Ryan Leaf. But in three seasons with San Diego and Dallas, he threw 36 picks and only 14 scores, never displaying what had dazzled them all in college. I remember writing after the Rose Bowl, this guy will be terrific. He's, he's cocky, but he, in a good way, in a Brett Favre kind of way. Little did I know, he was just a complete immature jerk. You heard me, you heard all the Ryan Leaf is the quintessential bust. He was supposed to be the savior of a franchise. They mortgaged their future and changed the whole culture of their franchise to get him. Ryan Leaf has been um, suspended um, and fined for conduct detrimental. 
the club. He was way too an explosive personality to deal with failure. I have been selfish and I have let my personal shortcomings get in the way of my professional behavior. Ryan Leaf was not prepared for the NFL, the maturity level. I intend to work hard on and off the field, and I would appreciate it if we did not address this issue again. My success depends on the support of my teammates and the San Diego community, and I promise to move forward in a positive direction. The ability to practice, the ability to take that talent that he had and turn it into something. Once he got the money, he didn't want to work at it. He got too big, he became too opinionated in what he wanted, and all he did was throw interceptions. Steps into traffic, throws, intercepted again! Where the hell was Leaf throwing that one? Brian Leaf could have gotten away with struggling on the field and acting like a complete jerk if he'd shown his teammates that he was tough. They thought he was soft, and that killed him. He didn't have the people skills or the mental skills. He was horrendous with the media, which doesn't help when you're that high profile. Listen, don't talk to me, all right? Knock it off! What are you doing? You know, you got cameras in there, and he just acted like a petulant little kid who couldn't handle the pressure. People thought that if he really would try to learn, maybe he could have been great. He never tried. He never really cared. If Ryan Leaf ever shows up in San Diego County again, he had better wear a mask. The NFL really stands for National Fanatics League. For football, it's a sport of passion, and that attracts the ragingly fickle and downright loony. The draft is where their team finds their savior, the player who knows the way to the promised land. But what happens when it turns out that the savior couldn't find the promised land with a GPS? Well, it leads to a second guess. And that, in turn, leads to our resident second guessers, Mike hand me a towel Greenberg and Mike Fifthman in on a four-man line Golick. Guys? All right, I think it is beyond argument that Ryan Leaf is indeed the number one draft bust of all time. So maybe we should Not so fast, my friend. Not so it fast. It is what? not beyond argument. Because I don't think Ryan Leaf deserved to be picked that high anyway when I was looking at him coming out of college. For my money, Tony Mandrich, who came in second, is the biggest bust ever in the NFL draft. Mike, let's go back to Ryan Lee for a minute here. There were talent evaluators across the National Football League who were up nights leading up to that draft. Is it Peyton Manning or is it Ryan Leaf? That was close. Peyton Manning is already a Hall of Fame quarterback. He just put together the greatest season in the history of the sport, and there were many who felt Ryan Leaf was ahead of him. So there what? were many they're, who they, would have taken these, Ryan Leaf ahead of Peyton say, Manning. They say many had Tim Couch up there. I would say the talent evaluation isn't doing a pretty good job. Tony Mandridge was destroying people in college. Tony Mandridge was on the cover of every magazine out there saying he was the next great and he absolutely bombed he is to me the biggest bust ever in the nfl the reality is there are a lot of reasons why quarterbacks are higher profile than offensive linemen and people notice a lot more when the quarterback implodes and he's making an idiot of himself yelling at reporters yelling at fans and flat out stinking on the football field i put leaf ahead of well, mandarich i wouldn't even have mandarich second and where is jeff george on this list i, I agree oh, with that way. yeah where is jeff george the perception of jeff Jeff George is that he was such a bad yeah, guy yeah. that he brought down his own enormous talent. The guy I would say is not even a bust at all on this list is Lawrence Phillips. And what Lawrence Phillips is is a great example of you get what you pay for in life. If you take uh, a Lawrence chance Phillips. on a guy like Lawrence Phillips, number six, you deserve what happens. Well, talent-wise, I mean, Lawrence Phillips was a high draft pick. He was. He was considered to be an excellent back, and he absolutely busted out. I have a little problem putting guys like to John Carter and Steve Entman on this list because it's really unfair to call Injury. them busts. If those guys hadn't gotten hurt, you never know how good they would have been. I think Entman would have been a great player. Maybe Kajana Carter would have been a great player. Blair Thomas is more of a bust as a running back than Kajana Carter because Blair Thomas just stunk. He just couldn't play. Kajana Carter got hurt. That's not his fault. And I'll tell you about another player who maybe I don't think deserves to be as high on this list, and he's number four, and that's Brian Bosworth. Brian Bosworth was his own creation, and credit to him for that and his marketing strategies to get him a lot of money. But I don't really think a lot of people thought he was going to come into the NFL and do a good job, and he certainly didn't. And finally, I'll say this. Another guy I'd like to see higher on this list is Rashan Salam, who blazed a trail, if you will excuse the expression, for Ricky Williams so many years later. We should give Salam some credit, if only for being 
being Ricky before Ricky was Ricky and bringing marijuana to the National Football There you have it. Overall, not a bad list. I would just change the order. No, Ryan Leaf is a fine number one. Tony Mandridge should be number one. You are not only unsightly, but you know nothing about football.